Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Downtime Should Never Be Unplanned, Rising to ICOT Challenges in the Midst of COVID-19, with Kristen Polos and Galena Antova, and moderated by Chris Gabe Offier. I'm Liz Fox, Senior Marketing Events Coordinator at Tripwire, and I'm excited to be part of today's event. So now, let's get started by introducing our panel. Our first speaker today is Kristen Polos. Kristen first joined Belden, Tripwire's parent company, in 2010 as Tripwire's general manager of industrial security, cybersecurity business. Kristen leads a team responsible for delivering new cybersecurity capabilities to a rapidly expanding market. Our second speaker is Galena Antova. Galena is a cybersecurity entrepreneur and an executive with over 15 years in cybersecurity. For the last nine years, Galena has focused on advancing the state of cybersecurity for critical infrastructure, first through her work of establishing and leading industrial security services at Siemens, and later through co-founding Clarity. Today's presentation will be moderated by Gabe Austin. Gabe is a senior product manager at Tripwire. He has over 15 years of experience in product management and information technology. So now, without further delay, I will turn it over to Gabe to get started. Great. Thanks for those introductions, Liz, and welcome Kristen and Galena. We're excited to have you here uh, to talk about uh, some of the challenges um, that we're seeing amidst this COVID crisis, and in particular, how it relates to IT and OT security. Um, so just to give a quick outline of what we're going to be doing today, um, we're going to start um, with Kristen kind of giving an, an, out, an overview of the IT, OT security pre-COVID and then talking about some of the challenges amidst the, amidst the COVID crisis. And then we're gonna switch it over to Galena talking about mitigating current security challenges and how to address downtime and loss production. Um, and then we'll kind of just go through um, some, some question and answer uh, type out, uh, format there for um, the majority of the presentation today. Uh, but we will leave the last 10 minutes for some Q and A uh, live Q&A with the panel. So uh, I do encourage you to uh, type in those questions in the in the box that Liz uh, was referring to in the platform, and we will be taking those uh, towards the end. And then I'll um, do a quick summary toward, at the very end of the presentation, and, and Liz will uh, conclude with some, some housekeeping items. Um, so with that, um, I would I just want to talk a little bit more about what we're going to what we're going to be covering today. And, so after the onset of COVID-19, org organizations pivoted quickly from a fixed traditional kind of infrastructure to a more virtual and distributed to support remote workers and enable social distancing. The nature of the company's responses to the COVID crisis opens organizations up to more risk, less resiliency and redundancy. So what we wanna look at is how we can make sure you're, you have a flex your flexible architecture and dispersed teams can deal with the penetrations, loss of connectivity, and other outages. So with that, we're going to turn it over to Kristen to talk a little bit about IT, OT security pre-COVID. So Kristen, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Gabe. We're really happy to be here. Um, you know, for as devastating a situation as a global pandemic has been, um, I believe there will be truly a long-term positive impact on manufacturing and OT security. This concept of the, the factory of the future, meaning a safer or more secure, more productive environment is, is going to be the long-term result. Now, there are challenges and steps to take, which we're gonna have to overcome. We're gonna talk about a lot of those today. So the attack surface is changing and it's expanding. Um, some teams that have never seen eye to eye must now work together. And there will be a lot of new investments in technologies. But when you think about um, the sentiment surrounding Industry 4.0 or ITOT convergence prior to the pandemic, you probably can recall a limited number of organizations that had truly embraced it and were really dedicating large budgets to advancing digital transformation, and a whole lot of organizations that would talk about the potential and maybe have small side projects on it. Um, and that's because for as good as the promise of digital transformation, it really did mean significant investment in new resources and technologies. And, and some organizations just didn't have the bandwidth to fully invest. And sometimes um, there really wasn't the impetus quite yet to invest, just the promise. So investment and transformation and security was a lot less prevalent. So how did organizations 
operations approach security before COVID, um, it meant that there was quite a bit of fragmentation between IT and OT teams. We, we had begun seeing the more mature organizations build out formal positions and processes, um, and that was to build bridges or fill gaps with their organization, but these silos still existed. We saw most organizations were taking a fairly long process to evaluate security tools and, and really help them achieve just a foundational level of control, predominantly within uh, the realm of asset visibility, you know, know what you need to secure. But now the game's changed. Um, the security landscape is evolving, and I, I mentioned this word impetus. COVID-19 is that impetus. It has demanded producers be more flexible to adapt to changes in demand mix. It's required organizations to solve for secure remote access to critical infrastructure. It's demanded these environments be more secure. Um, and when you think about high value production and intellectual property, speaking specifically about things like the production of prescription medication or vaccines, the post COVID environment is going to require better security stronger controls, uh, because it's really going to be about not just maintaining safety and security, but monitoring output quality. So I'm really looking forward to sharing the virtual stage with you both uh, and having this much needed discussion today. Great. And I uh, really appreciate that overview, Kristen. And Galena, um, over to you to talk a little bit further about some things that uh, you're seeing uh, out there right now. Thank you. Thank you, Gabe. Um, and I think Kristen did a really good job of outlining how our world has changed so quickly in the last few months. Um, I must say, uh, both for our teams and for our customers, it was a very, very intense time, um, not only because of the extreme um, changes that we had to make in the infrastructure, not only because of the increased attack surface, but also because of the toll it took on a lot of security professionals. Um, a lot of the teams were just um, um, exhausted from, from having to do so many things in such a, a rapid succession, and they were the defenders, basically, of that infrastructure. So with that being said, I think uh, don't ever let a good crisis go to waste. I think we have learned so much during uh, the last four months. And one of the most important things from my perspective as I reflect um, is to really see, observing many of the large Fortune 500 organizations from the interactions that we're having with them, and specifically, obviously, the pharmaceutical sector, which is obviously a key uh, core infrastructure, not only because of, um, of the type of products they produce, but especially now going forward with vaccines. One of the, uh, one of the silver linings is that the crisis really created alignment all the way, not only between IT and OT teams, but also between the technology teams, security executives, all the way to the board, right? Uh, I mean, in most cases, uh, boards were getting together every couple of weeks. They were really getting into the details of what is our strategy, how are we adapting to this new reality of working from home, and in some cases, even running our manufacturing processes um, to a certain extent remotely. And I think that alignment created compassion and understanding for the tremendous challenges associated with digital transformation. And it also made something very clear. Um, digital transformation is not just some fancy word that we can you know, throw around to look like we're, uh, we're being modern it really comes down to enabling business outcomes. And the crisis forced us to probably accelerate that 10x. I have seen projects that previously were meant to take two, three years being done now in two to three months. Um, so what that tells us is that we could really um, have a pace that we self-impose so that we go through that initial pain of updating our infrastructure, of course, with security in mind, um, so that we can enable the business outcomes faster while doing that in a in a secure way. So that probably will be like my number one silver lining is the alignment and the understanding that digital transformation is actually a competitive advantage. It is not something that um, CISOs and CIOs uh, come up with to torture the rest of the organization. And the reality is that like any infrastructure change, it is extremely painful, especially for a lot of the customers that we deal with. Um, you know, a lot of them, not only in their OT environment, but in general, deal with infrastructure, IT infrastructure that are much less flex 
accessible than you know someone like Facebook, for example. So it's a it's a real cha challenge, and I'm again, despite all the pain that we experienced in the last few months, I'm happy to see so many customers um, really get it right in such a short period of time while at the same time getting that exposure to the board and to their peers, which I think will get them tremendous buy-in for those type of projects going forward. So um, let's, not wait, let's not waste the crisis that we've been given. It's an amazing opportunity, and I think a lot of security teams, CISOs, and CIOs will carry this momentum forward um, and get a lot more support from their organizations for the changes that we need to make. Yeah, no, that's that's great, and I mean, both both you and Kristen, you know, touched on this idea of digital transformation, and I love the the spin you put on it with you know the fact that you know as companies do that digital transformation, it, it really turns into a competitive advantage for them. But at the same time, you know, you have to make sure that you're securing um, <clears throat> those particular assets that uh, are coming online as as you're doing that digital transfer transformation. So I think that's a something good to point out. Um, Galena, a, a question that, that I've got for you is, um, you know, as the, the crisis has come up, it's tested the resiliency of secure remote connectivity uh, to production mm -hmm. OT sites. And my question is, how are, how are companies that need to run physical, manu pro physical manufacturing processes uh, adapting to this? Yeah. Um, so that's a great question, and it's probably one of the more vivid use cases that we have, especially in the manufacturing domain. So secure, so secure remote access back to the manufacturing shop floor has always been something that has been um, challenging, because in, in many cases it's not implemented properly, or in some cases the OT teams are simply told that they cannot have this type of flexibility. Um, of course, the crisis forced a very different conversation uh, between also the IT team and the OT team because in most cases IT is uh, controlling the security to those domains and OT needs that connectivity for more operational topics such as maintenance, um, making updates and upgrades and, and during the COVID crisis also running partially some of those physical processes um, remotely. So what I've observed is that companies that have already put some thought and some technology into that infrastructure to enable access, they were on one end of the spectrum in terms of how easy, relatively easy it was for them to um, make that switch because perhaps they were expanding now from a maintenance use case to a more operational use case, but the infrastructure was already there. Whereas the, whereas the ones that have been much more restrictive um, and trying to take the approach of like really isolating or air gapping their um, environment, which of course in reality can never exist in a, in a, in a, in a perfect way, um, they basically were faced with the choice of either shutting down uh, production completely, at least for a period of time, or implementing measures that, um, of course, when you do things on the fly, they were never as secure as you when you had the time to uh, to plan it. So, um, from a demand perspective, we have seen this use case starting to get taken really, really seriously. I would say, um, as you know, we work with a lot of customers delivering a lot of core security controls to their operational technology, and secure remote access is one of those security controls. I would say that before COVID, this was viewed as something nice to have. It was nice extension to all the other core use cases. But to be honest, it wasn't really taken as a core use case because it was seen more of a, as, a, as a convenience use case. Um, I have to tell you that this changed. Uh, a lot of our conversations with prospects and customers now start with that use case um, as, as the primary driver because they understand um, the value of, of, of connectivity. And of course here, I cannot highlight enough the need for the IT and OT teams to collaborate because there is no such thing as a separate IT and an OT network. This is not how the attackers and the adversaries are looking at your environment. And so whether that connectivity goes to directly to the OT or directly to the IT, it doesn't matter at the end of the day from the adversary's perspective because they could find a way of, of exploiting that. It is all one network, it is all one environment. So. Um, that is one of the use cases that really brought the IT and the OT teams together. Um, again, good crisis, but I think we, uh, bad crisis, 
but we sell good outcomes out of it. Yeah, no, that's that's an interesting point you make about the IT and OT uh, collaborating on these remote connectivity pro pro projects and ultimately uh, bringing the two sides of the organization together, um, which, you know, th throughout the years, uh, you know, has been somewhat of a struggle, you know, making sure that they see eye to eye. So good to hear that they're coming together on those type on this type of project and, um, you know, making some advancements in those relationships. So that's that's great to hear. Um, Kristen, a question for you. Um, so I'm just curious about the impact of the COVID crisis has on the digital transformation projects that you're seeing, and in particular, cloud native solutions. Um, what's, what's your thoughts yeah. on that? Well, you know, the crisis has not only increased, I guess, the interest in digital transformation mm -hmm. and cloud native concepts, it's increased the acceptance of it. Um, you know, a year ago, maybe even six months ago, many users in the space, they were intrigued by digital transformation. And, you know, we've attended, uh, even you and I, Gabe, attended conferences yep. where digital transformation was a, a big topic of conversation. Um, but it was just a lot of intrigue or maybe small budgets dedicated towards it. Uh, but a lot of organizations hadn't even maybe started that journey yet. And those same users were even further resistant six, 12 months ago to cloud native solutions because they just, they didn't see the near team, uh, near term need for it. So uh, we might walk in and uh, ask about curiosity around cloud native solutions 12 months ago and, and we would hear the feedback, well, that's interesting, but I don't really see a need for that today. Uh, fast forward to a reality where manufacturing flexibility is now critical, uh, where we can now use data to make decisions on whether you're producing a high quality product, uh, whether your manufacturing equipment is in need of, of repair, or, or whether your process is fully protected from malicious outsiders. And these organizations who have embarked on these projects are really seeing a significant advantage for having done so. Whereas everyone else uh, who had maybe talked about the, the promise and the potential of digital transformation are now saying, wow, those guys were really onto something. So this, has, uh, th this event, this crisis has um, helped lend credibility to digital transformation projects that had already begun um, and lend others the fuel they need to receive the budget approval to proceed. And I, I really like something that Galena said in the beginning about enabling business outcomes because um, it might have been hard for organizations all the way up from the, to the C-level and BOD to see what a real positive outcome of a digital transformation project might be prior to this crisis. Now the outcomes are, are very squarely slapping people in the face and the impetus to start on them, um, including investment in cloud native technologies is there. Yeah, that's, uh, well, Chris, go ahead. Uh, just to mention Please. here, I absolutely love the terms that you used, and I'm and I'm going to borrow them. So, it moved from a strategic project to a critical project, mm -hmm. and this makes me laugh because yeah. my finance professor in my MBA, a, all the strategic projects are the ones that have negative MP, a, MPV, and you cannot justify why you're doing them. And I think a lot of organizations view digital transformation in that way of like, why are we disrupting ourselves? Right? It was like. A, a strategic thing to do, but it wasn't really critical. And I think the crisis really showed them that it is critical. It is a competitive advantage. So I think that's going to be my my new tagline for the blog. So I'm, I'm feeling that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. on it, but Thanks for the flashback yeah, sure. to be cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, and Kristen, I'll, I'll uh, set this one over to you, and then I'll, I'll have Galena comment on it as well. But are there certain types of incidents that um, concern you more now? Uh, and I'm talking about cybersecurity incidents that concern you more now with the rise of COVID and, and some of the transformation that's happening. Um, and are, are we seeing any particular incidents on the rise? Yeah, well, with digital transformation, you just, you open up more doors for malicious outsiders to, to come in. Um, you know, I was just reading this week about foreign actors trying to hack vaccine research, you know, and they were using malware in, a, in an attempt to steal intellectual property. Um, and, you know, surely at this point, this kind of data is invaluable. Um, nations have identified a vaccine as, as really, or a medical breakthrough as really that key to reopening economies. Um, and so, you know, when you think about um, what hackers or bad actors could do with that information, um, it could be potentially devastating. And, you know, I've also seen recently a few instances of, of ransomware being used mm -hmm. 
used to target both the, the pharma community, but also uh, in the automotive space, one of the largest uh, worldwide automotive manufacturers was targeted with ransomware. So there's a, a lot of incidents on the rise right now. I think the bad actors know that this is a time for rapid transformation in organizations, and uh, they're certainly not taking 2020 off. They're taking advantage. Yeah, and Galena, anything to, to add there from your perspective? I would just like to um, echo kind of a couple of insights that align to what Kristen said. Um, so first of all, no question about, you know, I've, I've been talking about this topic of economic warfare when it comes to like industrial networks and the, and the importance of those networks uh, to critical infrastructure and what makes them um, so appealing to adversaries with uh, uh, geopolitical agendas. Obviously, now the pharmaceutical sector, especially the companies that are actively involved in supporting um, the efforts around COVID, no question about it, they will absolutely be prime targets. And one of the challenges that we face as an industry, and that's a new challenge, it's not a new challenge, but it's something that um, still remains a challenge, even in, in 2020, is the simple fact that we lack visibility from those OT networks compared to um, all the different ways in which we can see the data, the security telemetry from IT. We're, we're pretty, um, uh, we are operating blind. The security teams are operating blind in a lot of those environments. And that asymmetry um, in our defense posture creates a lot of opportunities um, for the defender. So while you know organizations such as ours and the federal government and few other handful um, organizations that are helping um, companies on the front lines to defend against those type of um, attacks we, we might have seen some examples some of those might be public i really believe that we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg um, because we have visibility into a very limited number of those environments and um, the absence of evidence is not evidence for the absence of the attackers in those networks. We just don't have the same level of confidence and visibility into those networks. So that continues to be a problem, and I think will um, will will hinder our efforts of like how fast we can even be aware of some of those intrusions that are taking place. Now that's kind of one extreme angle is the nation states geopolitical agendas. Mm -hmm. On the other side, the the very simple truth is that. Adversaries of, of, of all kinds of you know criminal backgrounds have figured out one very simple thing, which is that industrial networks are critical to the operations of manufacturing, specifically again pharmaceutical be, being one of those key points. And if they are critical to your operations, you would care about them. And so ransomware, as Kristen pointed out, is definitely on the rise. Um, and again, I anticipate to see many different ways in which those attacks are, are being monetized. Um, if anything from just pure uh, uh, financial gain to again much broader geopolitical um, attention so i think in order for us to be enabled as defenders we really need to take the first step which is the, having at least the same visibility into our networks that the attackers have so that we um, fix a little bit that asymmetry of what we can see and what they can see in our own networks yeah that's a that's a great point and you know, just having that visibility is extremely important. And, and once you have the visibility in terms of the assets on your network and, and maybe the communication flow between those assets, so, you know, which assets are talking to which other assets um, is, is important. And then with that, um, you can do some things around segmentation. And, and that kind of leads me to my, my next question um, for Kristen is, you know, segmentation obviously is important, uh, particularly in production environments and pharma. And you know, what are some of the ways um, that we can deal with this in these times? Um, I, I can think of a couple ways. So yeah, the segmentation is one of those classic enterprise IT tactics, but now it's incredibly important in production environments um, like those farm and found in pharma. Um, perimeter defenses are, are no longer enough, um, especially, as I mentioned, in these digitally transformed uh, organizations. Um, you, you have to have defenses within your networks to combat the threats. Um, and so that's where segmentation comes into play. The first step uh, of segmentation, of course, is to you know find your OT network of, and segment it into zones. And, and these would be zones of assets that can be um, separately controlled and monitored from, from other zones. And from there, yeah, there, there's two really ways to approach 
approach this. One, um, I can say uh, set up virtual zones. Um, this can be something where you're viewing it through a user interface and you can monitor the traffic in and out of these zones. But another tactic, um, which I really like, is to zone off with the uh, seat packet inspection, um, CPI, uh, which is a deeper type of security um, into the specific industrial communication. It actually delves into every packet. And you can use DPI uh, on a variety of tools uh, and platforms, or you can, you can use physical firewalls to do that. Um, and like you said, Gabe, it's, it's really a great next step once you have actually been able to gain that asset visibility level to then start thinking about how you want to segment off um, and control your networks because um, f uh, perimeter defenses are just no longer enough. Yeah, certainly. And you know, with the, the capabilities out there now, I mean, you can you can do segmentation, you know, via the hardware, and then even within that hardware, of course, you can do your virtual VLANs and, and segmentations that way as well, which is important. I think you brought up a, an interesting point with um, the ability to do the deep packet inspection, and, and once you know what the communication should be, should ha be happening on that particular network in between particular devices that uh, you can basically set it up, learn that communication pattern, and then um, you know, turn it on in a way where you can actually block any malicious traffic that might be trying to come through that same same network. So I think that's an interesting point. Um, Galena, one for you. Um, so you know, making changes into a production environment such as pharma is a lengthy process. What approaches slash technologies are non-invasive and can help with security without breaking the regulatory certification that, of course, pharma needs. Yeah, especially for this vertical within manufacturing, there are just um, so many rules um, associated with how you certify um, those systems, and those are all for good reasons. And installing anything on the endpoint devices um, themselves, in many cases, uh, triggers a recertification of that process, which could be a very, very timely uh, process which of course naturally triggers that tension between um, IT and OT and so okay do we do we do security or do we go through a, uh, a lengthy process specifically for those kind of environments that are extremely sensitive to changes I think that the passive approach has been um, extremely helpful um, we have the benefit we have the benefit of the specific um, characteristics of operational technology networks, which means that they communicate a lot of their functionality, a lot of their asset information directly on the network level, unlike um, you know more, more traditional IT devices. So actually just by listening passively, we can identify not only the traffic patterns and identify malicious activities, but we can also extract information such as a very, very detailed asset information just by that passive um, a passive listening. And so if you can fulfill 95% of your core security uh, functions and uh, use cases by just using that approach, um, that is a huge win. And again, the OT networks, because of the machine-to-machine -machine, uh, collab uh, machine -machine communication, really mm -hmm. allows us to do that from a technology perspective. So this is an approach that I've seen a lot of um, a lot of companies take, especially in the pharmaceutical um, vertical, uh, which is very different than, for example, you know, in, in automotive or other ones where you've got uh, more of a, uh, a, a different sensitivity than you, you when, when there's a downtime on the weekends, for example, you could do things like active queries, et cetera. So it's really important, I think, to not have a perfectionistic uh, view on what we can do, but just to think about, you know, in the next week, month, with the whatever, thousand dollars, ten thousand, whatever your budget ends, ends to be, if those are my constraints, what is the most impactful thing that I could do in the next month to reduce um, the risk? Um, and so just because the alternative is just to sit back and be planning forever, um, and that is something that hasn't worked really well because the adversaries, I can assure you, are not waiting around for us to, um, to build the defenses. So I would just focus on that unit the maximum unit of risk reduction based on the available time, resources, and money you have to invest into the problem. Um, of course, considering all the restrictions of the environment. So passive works really well for that constraint. Oh, that's great. Yeah, the, the passive approach certainly has um, taken hold um, when it comes to um, securing your OT network, um, just because again, you know, it's not intrusive. So you're not you're not worried about you know scanning networks and um, you know, potentially um, bringing down uh, particular assets that, um, you know, just can't
can't handle those type of those type of scans. And so the uh, the passive approach on OT is certainly um, taken hold from from what we're seeing in the market. Um, Kristen, one for you. Um, so it, it kind of comes back to the the digital transformation that we've been touching on, and I guess you know we've talked about kind of current state, um, but you know building building on that, what, what's the role of digital transformation as we continue to move into the future? And I guess, how do you see that progressing um, as companies, you know, start looking into this? And, and I guess the, the rate of digital transformation maybe is another thing you could touch on. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, the, the rate to start, I think it's, it's going to highly, highly accelerate from here on out um, because that potential um, is now realized and it's no longer a strategic project. Um, you know, when I think of digital transformation and what it means to organizations um, like pharma companies, I think of cybersecurity, first of all, as an enabler of it. You are never going to be able to fully take advantage of the benefits of digital transformation if you don't commit your organization to becoming more secure. Um, with digital transformation, you are fundamentally changing the way that data in your network is communicated, the way it's gathered, uh, and the way it's used in your OT environments. Um, and so, you know, again, you're, you're opening more doors for attackers by, by changing the way you're working with the data. So cybersecurity becomes arguably the most critical investment you make as you embark on this digital transformation journey. Um, now, what it means for companies um, can be a huge list of benefits. Um, this can range from, you know, things like predictive maintenance on critical equipment. This can mean quality monitoring on process output where you have finely, finely tuned uh, recipes for a certain kind of product and output, being able to monitor that. Um, something like sensor fusion, where now you have a, a safer work environment um, and humans and cobots can work together more safely in, in safety cages. So there are all of these really great use cases that are going to enable these benefits that can be uh, monetized for organizations. Um, and it's ultimately going to create a, um, a better situation for the organizations making those investments um, in the form of better productivity or OE, but it's also going to make for an overall safer and more secure process, safer output for uh, customers, um, but safer working environment for, for the, uh, the users as well. So to, to answer the question again, um, from here, digital transformation uh, accelerates tremendously, um, and it's just going to be a matter of seeing which one of those, uh, you know, particular use cases. Um, you know, maybe secure remote access is one of the earliest ones, but what are the, these use cases that are now emerging that are going to win out and be the first things that organizations begin investing in? Yeah, I think that's that's interesting, and I mean, I think that the type of uh, devices that are going to be starting to show up on these networks. I mean, we're seeing it when it comes to digital transformation. We're a lot of times talking about, you know, additional sensors and and um, additional industrial IoT um, devices, Internet of Things, um, and so we are seeing those uh, start to come on the OT networks more and more. And um, you know, with that, you just again, it comes down to you got to make sure that you're tracking each one of those assets and um, and making sure that you're keeping them secure in terms of maintaining the proper firmware versions and so forth. And you know, I think some of the tools out there um, allow you to do that in a in a automated way. Where uh, again, if something new pops up on the network, you're notified. You can look at what it is, and then uh, obviously, you know, make sure that it should be there, and you can uh, ultimately make sure that it's got the the correct firmware and, and it's patched appropriately. So I think that's a, mm -hmm. a good one for sure. Um, moving Dave, on maybe, to, uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I, had a, I had a reflection as, um, as Kristen yep. was, was talking about the, um, the changes. I also think that impacts, again, going back to alignment, I think it impacts also and accelerates um, the organization creating a joint uh, governance processes. Um, so in other words, rather than just looking at those specific technologies and processes for OT in isolation, I think that we are seeing and we'll see a lot more of uh, consolidated governance. So in other words, vulnerability management, for example, would be one topic and one core security control. It would just be implemented mm -hmm. slightly different in OT and in IT. Um, because I think that the crisis also changed to a certain extent, the definition of what digital transformation is. I, my 
perception is that in the past it was seen as a lot more of a patchwork, right? So like add more um, sensors, add more connectivity, add more exposure. Whereas I'm seeing now people starting to rethink it because again of, of all the challenges of that additive work, they're starting to rethink it as, okay, if the objective is visibility across the whole organization, vulnerability management across the whole organization, how do we implement it in a way that we can do that with one team, um, you know, perhaps using different technologies, but definitely as defenders for us to see the whole um, the whole workflow, to see, to have a view of the whole governance process. And that's yet another way in which it has brought together the IT and the OT teams because it's just simply impossible to manage if you're managing risk at the end of the day, which is what we do, it is impossible to kind of manage it in two dashboards, so to speak, with uh, two different teams, two different governance processes. So I, I am seeing, and I think we'll see a lot more in the future, the digital transformation also means um, being a lot more bold in how we define our new infrastructure going forward and not just thinking about a patchwork and infrastructure definitely means also governance processes, workflows and teams that are managing that new infrastructure that we're uh, putting into place. Of course, that generates its own cost advantages, which is yet another way in which digital transformation becomes a competitive advantage from a pure financial standpoint. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree. And um, again, just getting back to that competitive advantage that you that you get when you start uh, implementing some of these uh, technologies that uh, ultimately are tied to the digital transformation. And I think, um, you know, you, you've touched on it a bit, but I, I kind of want to be explicit about it. Um, and uh, Galena, I'll, I'll set this one over to you and then and Kristen can chime in as well. But so are, are you seeing um, as especially with the, the digital transformation and maybe the expansion of the OT networks, um, are you seeing the collaboration between the IT and OT, um, you know, uh, are, how are you seeing that rate in terms of the collaboration between uh, the, the two sides of the organization in terms of securing the IT side and the OT side? Maybe we can just dive into that a little bit more. Yeah, it certainly accelerated. I mean, just as a, as a benchmark, um, I think Actually, we've made tremendous progress in the last um, three to four years. So mm -hmm. even comparing um, how things were five years ago, there was barely any conversation uh, between those those two groups. So um, I think that the the adversaries already and the awareness already pushed those two groups to collaborate together. So at least they weren't, they didn't hate being in the same room with each other. Um, the crisis simply accelerated that and it forced them to think um, not just, I, I, you know, my perception is that the conversations in the past were, okay, we tolerate each other, we understand why we have to work with each other. Um, you know, for the OT engineers, it was, okay, I'll let security help me implement security in, in my networks, but really it was still very much how we do things in OT is very, very different than how we do things in IT, right? Like we kept on hearing that refrain over and over again. Um, the crisis gave them a common common enemy, right? People, just to take a very simple use case, people needed to connect remote, remotely, right? Whether that was just to do their daily, daily jobs or to do remote maintenance on the OT networks, they needed that remote connectivity. And so it became a much more of a joint conversation. Um, they identified a lot of ways, for example, um, uh, uh, in which, you know, production uh, couldn't, couldn't be, uh, had to go down or, or couldn't be maintained. And so, that just gave them a lot more exposure to adverse events that they had to take care of it together. And a lot of what I talked about, the joint processes and the governance, I think a greater acceptance for that came because they realized they couldn't be looking at two different sets of data and doing two parallel processes in the organization if they wanted to be um, successful. So COVID was the common enemy and they united against that. Um, I am hoping that this type of collaboration stays because it just really showed them that at the end of the day, they're working against a common enemy and the, the, the enterprise infrastructure is really just one, like adversaries don't care whether they're getting to OT networks or the IT networks, it's not like they'll be routed to a different SOC, it is all one infrastructure that is um, interconnected in more ways than we typically could imagine because again, we lack that visibility. Uh, of the OT networks themselves.
house and also of egress egress points from from the from the network so it built that trust um and it gave them few winning uh uh, cases where they actually implemented projects together and saw them working and so just from a pure psychological perspective it just helped to build trust in the capabilities of the other team and brought them closer together mm -hmm. and Kristen are, are you seeing the same thing out there in terms of the, the increased collaboration between IT and OT in this in this day and age yeah yeah I'm in I'm in high agreement with that with everything Galena said and, and she's right you know we had started to see these teams um, at least forced to meet with, with one another, you know, three or four years ago. But what the crisis has really driven is instead of a forced meeting, it's now collaboration. And the thing that I like to point back to is this old CIA triad that we always used to talk about, right? We always used to say, okay, the IT guys, they, in this particular order, care about confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And the OT guys, well, they actually want the reverse in that order. They want availability first and then integrity and then confidentiality. When you bring these two teams together in a more collaborative way, which this crisis has done, it now becomes more of a three pillar strategy where those three things all have equal importance to both groups as opposed mm -hmm. to you know four or five years ago where these two teams would be forced into a room together and they'd butt heads about what the priority is. Um, so what's come out of this is more collaboration uh, as opposed to just you know more being forced to talk to one another. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great point. Um, love love the idea of collaboration. Um, you know, should have probably started happening before now, but uh, and I think it has in some organizations, obviously. But uh, it's good to see that uh, we're taking advantage of the need to collaborate and, and really pushing that forward. Um, so we're about um, you know 43 minutes into this webcast, and I, I want to kind of switch over to some of the the audience questions at this point and, and give a few minutes for those. Um, and then still allowing some time for a quick wrap up and um, and so forth. So, you know, one of the things that's uh, come through here is given the importance of these uh, production re environments as it relates to vaccines, how should the pharma companies think of this increased attention potentially from nation state actors with geopolitical motivations? And uh, Galena, if you want to take a shot at that one first and then we'll let Kristen go. Sure, I'll start with it. Um, um, again, I think that it's it's really important that pharma companies um, take this situation very seriously, and I and I truly I've seen from my own uh, interactions that they really do. It goes way beyond normal times when you just need to implement defensive measures. Um, they are really uh, targets right now, and there is a reason why, even from a government perspective, they're talking about. Um, you know, actions against adversaries that are getting into those type of environments and trying to steal the IP. Um, the underlying challenge, again, I'll go back to that because it's just so fundamental, is the lack of visibility, right? So we could build, as we know, you know, defense in depth is a great strategy, but it has its limitations. Um, especially for nation state adversaries that we can presume that they have pretty much almost unlimited resources and capabilities, they will find a way into your organization one way or another. And let's not forget that, um, like anything else in manufacturing, a lot of those facilities have a physical footprint as well. So you've got um, additional attack vectors. So I think what's really important to um, do in addition to kind of uh, making sure that we have preventative measures in place is the ability to know when there is a new abnormal activity on those networks, right? Whether that's someone, um, a, a new device popping up in the network, a new type of communication from an HMI that we haven't seen in the past. And for those on the webinar that work within operational technology, uh, they understand that OT has very unique challenges when it comes to actually um, attacking the code and how those industrial systems interact. I mean, once you're on the network, I'm oversimplifying, of course, but all you need to do is a new instance. Um, you, you need to get onto a uh, engineering station that has uh, basically the program for the controller and then controls the physical process. And by using the tools of the controllers itself, you can change the code, upload new code, now, because those are normal operations, this is what the underlying control system does, 
those are hard to detect by traditional IT tools, right? And so this is where specialized knowledge of the protocols and what we're seeing on the networks um, is extremely important. So we, we have to use different technologies, but the approach is the same as what we've been doing in IT for the last 20, 25 years. Detect lateral movements, identify new devices, identify if there's an abnormal activity as it relates to those um, um, uh, to those production machines. Um, and that is just absolutely cornerstone because if you have visibility, you as a defender have visibility into those networks and um, especially um, egress, egress points between IT and OT. Uh, if, if you were to, uh, to catch that on time when you see the first kind of instances from a um, kill chain perspective, you have a much better chance of preventing that because the advantage also that we have is for that type of manipulation in the OT networks to be successful, to be subtle and to be undetectable, attackers really need to learn how the process operates. They need to obviously be very well versed into the um, industrial um, operations. And so it's not as straightforward and as automated, I would say, as it is in the IT environment. So that gives us a little bit of an advantage. But we can only take advantage of, of that if we can detect abnormal activity the first time that, that it happens and take action immediately. So um, it is an absolutely fundamental and in many cases might be viewed from the IT specialist as a basic um, security control to have visibility. But just given the, the special situation around OT systems, it is just absolutely critical for us to have that early awareness and to be able to um, intercept that attack early in the kill chain. Yeah, no, that's that's a great, some great points you make there, uh, Galena. Thanks for that. Chris, anything you want to do to elaborate that and, on that? And then I'll go to our next question here. No, I, I think that was a great answer. Okay, great. Um, a question here uh, is, I was wondering if globally customers are cutting costs for ICS right now amongst the COVID-19 pandemic um, or, or not, and how, how that's ultimately effect, affected globally. Uh, and um, Galena, why don't you take a stab at that and then we'll let Kristen chime in. Sure. So did you hear the question, Galena? I did, I was on mute, sorry. <laughs> yeah, okay, um, sorry. So, um, uh, so we, we, we have not seen cuts in the ICS budget. Um, we saw for maybe a few weeks, for a couple of months, a pause in the project, especially for organizations that just needed to deal with, with other priorities. The security teams were completely overwhelmed, as I mentioned in the opening. Um, but organizations absolutely understand the priority of um, the OT networks and their strategic importance to the business. Um, so it just took them a pause to address urgent priorities, and in many cases that also meant how do we keep production up, up and running, um, secure remote access, et cetera. And then we, we saw just kind of a normalization of going back to our normal projects. Got it. Kristen, on from your side. Yeah, in, in agreement, this was a, maybe just a temporary blip where everybody needed an opportunity to catch their breath. Um, mm -hmm. And so we didn't see any budget cuts, really. We just saw maybe a budget pauses where people needed to get their feet under them. And as we've been looking at this, and we've been kind of trying to dive in on a vertically specific level, so really look at uh, verticals like pharmaceutical or automotive and, and see how um, their budgets are evolving, you know, there's still the same macroeconomic trends now that are influencing all of uh, the OT companies uh, kind of universally. So when you think about things like densities of the factory floor or the need to have more uh, flexible work arrangements um, or things or uh, trends like onshoring, that's only going to, to drive further investment in ICS. So um, the, we see this as uh, budgets actually um, being stable this year and then expanding um, in 2021 and beyond. Yeah, that's that's good to hear, and I think that's what we're what I've been seeing as well. Is again, there was that temporary stop, maybe in the in the March time frame, where customers might have been pausing on on a particular project because they're trying to get their head wrapped around what they're going to do, you know, internally to to keep the business going uh, amid, amongst the pandemic. Um, but uh, we we certainly saw a nice uptick, um, you know, June and beyond, really. Um, uh, business so yeah I, I would say that 
we're, we're not seeing necessarily any, any sort of uh, budget cuts uh, because of because of the pandemic. It might have just been a bit of a pause. Um, an interesting question coming from the audience that I, I wasn't necessarily anticipating, but I thought uh, I thought we'd address. Um, it's around bu building automation systems, actually, and um, and how this might kind of relate to the the idea of digital transformation as as again as a whole, just as buildings are becoming more and more digital and having these automation systems. And before they might have been somewhat of an afterthought, um, but organizations are now realizing how it can impact production uh, as well as health and safety and um, you know, Kristen, do you have a thought on 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 that and, and how this might tie into you know what we've been what we've been talking about? Yeah, well, you know, I think you can apply a lot of the same principles that we talked about today to building automation systems, and I, I think of them almost like like an OT network themselves. Um, they are um, they speak over proprietary protocols still, so BACnet's one of the ones that's um, the most prevalent. And you're talking about things like HVAC systems, access control systems, fire alarm systems that all are now converging over IP. So the same um, principles that we talked about and we shared today about you know gaining visibility first and understanding um, kind of the network traffic between the different building automation systems is a, is a good first step. Uh, and having security and visibility into those systems is going to be uh, critical because some of the same attacks that we talked about today um, will also be ones that building automation systems are susceptible to. And, and Galena, do you have any thoughts on that particular subject? So building systems are absolutely a type of industrial control system. So mm -hmm. um, not any different. Everything that we've talked about in, in this pot, uh, in this uh, webinar absolutely applies to them. Um, I would say th there is a there, there was a perception that they're not as critical as, as manufacturing or as electrical power plants or nuclear power plants. And I think that's understandable because we don't necessarily think of buildings as, as critical infrastructure. However, especially in the last year and a half, we've really seen a shift from that um, as companies realize that, um, especially for the ones that do not primarily rely on manufacturing, like shopping malls and commercial real estate, and even banks that have data centers. Data centers are just a different type of building with a lot more <laughs> cooling systems and HVAC and all that. Um, they have realized that that building infrastructure actually very closely interfaces and interacts with their IT systems. And just similar to the way manufacturing, we lack a lot of times the visibility. It's exactly the same thing with um, with building with building systems. If anything, they're a little bit even trickier to um, to support because they're extremely distributed. If you've ever been to a data center. You've probably seen just how gigantic they are, and a lot of those uh, control systems are just very distributed. Um, they haven't really been thought of as a network, so in many cases, you know, you'll have one switch in one place, one network infrastructure in another. From a network infrastructure, they're not as well planned as the network that we would see, the OT network that we would see in a pharmaceutical facility, for example. So in a sense, that makes them their, their physical distribution makes them even more challenging to address. Um, but I but I will say, um, like, absolutely from the security team's perspective, in the last year, year and a half, they're considering that part of their infrastructure. And um, it, it affects, actually, a lot of use cases that might not be obvious, but for commercial real estate, for example, um, think of, like, a city like, uh, you know, New York, they rent that infrastructure to a lot of, companies that handle very sensitive IPs, such as high profile um, law firms that are dealing with a lot of mergers and acquisitions, right? And so you can put all the security you want in your IT network if you're a high profile legal firm, but if you work in a building where someone could just access the DMS and the HVAC and find a pivot from there into your IT network, well, they're not, you're not really well prepared and then they're obviously lots and lots of other um, use cases. So sensitive IP is not only in manufacturing and, and in production, but there's so many other use cases where um, we're seeing a lot of clients starting to worry about that. So I would say absolutely it's becoming a key use case. And on the positive side, um, those networks are, um, they don't have the same legacy life cycle. So unlike a distributed control system that will be in an oil and gas facility for like 40 years, building management 
systems tend to get recycled sooner or faster, right? So like maybe every 10 years or so, 15 years, which is a win in LT. So that allows us to apply a lot more innovation and absolutely no question about it. When we think about digital transformation, uh, one of the key verticals of that is how we transform our cities and our building infrastructure uh, going forward and all kinds of interconnectivity that we have from like traffic lights to just sensors everywhere in our infrastructure. So that will that will become increasingly so one of the leading verticals actually that is that is driving that. Mm, yeah, no, that's that's excellent points. Um, and in particular, interesting to to hear about <clears throat> kind of how how that all comes back into yeah, it's, it's it might be thought of building automation, but really at the at the end of the day, it's really a, just an industrial control system with the HVAC and fire systems and everything else going on there. So. Um, with that, I think that we'll take that as our last question. And um, I did want to just thank uh, both Kristen and Galena again for, for being here and giving us insights. I mean, I think some of the things that we touched on and really came out in these conversations was, you know, that, you know, with the digital transformation, we're, we're starting to see the, the IT and OT come together, um, which, of course, is a good thing, something I think we've been waiting to see um, and, and now seeing it accelerate. So that's great. Um, we talked a bit about, um, you know, just the overall uh, what we need to do to make sure we're uh, securing these uh, industrial control systems and OT networks and, and being able to do that with, uh, you know, the various technologies. Uh, passive was mentioned, making sure that you've got um, segmentation properly done and so forth. So um, uh, with that, uh, I wanted to thank you guys again and um, uh, turn it over to Liz to do some uh, conclusions conclusions and housekeeping items. So uh, Liz, if you're there, we'll have you wrap up for us. Awesome. Thanks, Gabe. Um, yeah, I'd like to again thank our speakers, Kristen and Galena, for their very informative presentation. And thank you, Gabe, for moderating today. Um, also, a My huge pleasure. thank you to, thank you, <laughs> and a, a huge thank you to our audience for attending today and for joining us. Uh, we hope you found the presentation informative and useful to you. We'll be sending out a link to the on-demand version of the webinar.